I V M. This week's episode of the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast is brought to you by our sponsor, Storytel. Storytel is a website where you can access ebooks and audiobooks all in one place. And for the duration of their sponsorship of our show, we're going to be recommending a new book or ebook or audiobook to you each week. So this week, we have a great book by the author Gideon Haig, who writes for Wisdom, and it's called Sphere of Influence. It's about eight years old. It was released in 2011, right as the IPL was becoming a thing and T20 was, you know, starting to rise to popularity. So really interesting read just in terms of how the T20 format that we all love so much just became a thing and started to grow to the heights that it's achieved today. So again, if you visit storytell.com slash IVM, you get a 30-day free trial to Storytel instead of the normally available 14-day free trial. That's storytell.com slash IVM. We picked this book because if you make it to the end of this week's episode, you'll see that we're doing a little quiz that was actually on Wisdom before. And Gideon Haig, as we mentioned, is a writer for Wisdom. So stay tuned, try to make it through to the end of this extra long bumper episode, and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast. And you've got a full house again this week. It's DJ here, your host for this week. And I've got Ashwin and Varun with me. It's episode 90 of the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast. I know we released episode 88 last Monday, but we had a bonus episode with Kestrick Williams where we interviewed him about Virat Kohli, the notebook celebration and lots more other stuff. So we've actually jumped from 88, 89 and now we're at 90. And it is... Also, the last episode of the year for us. So it's super exciting. There's so much to chat about. We're going to be talking about the India West Indies ODI series. We're going to be talking about the IPL auction. We're going to be looking back over the year. We're going to be looking back over the decade. And then we've got a special quiz at the end of it as well. So it's going to be a fantastic episode. But first, let me welcome my co-host to the show. Varun, how's it going, man? Good to have you back on. Thanks, DJ. It feels like you, every week you say good to have you back on, but I'm here pretty much every week. <laughs> you know, that's just an inside joke. <laughs> Shwin, how's it going, dude? It's good, man. Nice to be back this time. Nice to have Varun again with us. So it's good. I know, I know. We, we just kid that that he's sometimes a guest on this podcast. Of course, he's an integral and actually sometimes the most important part of the podcast. So, guys, let let's get straight into the chat. It's um. We are recording about an hour and a half, actually, after the third ODI has just completed at Cuttack. And uh, as our listeners will no doubt know, India have won the India uh, West Indies ODI series, winning it 2-1, as brackets Ashwin and I both predicted last week. And Varun, of course, went with the West Indies winning. But let's move back to the second ODI at Vizag, right? Uh, India were 1-0 down when we recorded this last. We were a bit, uh, bit down with that uh, result. We didn't quite know what to make of it. And um, India weren't looking like the kind of champion side that they were. And so they they lost quite comprehensively in the first ODI. So they made some changes for the second ODI. They first brought in Shardul for Dubey. So Ashwin, let me get your thoughts on that very quickly. Just on the selection. Why Shardul for Dubey? What do you think I'm going to say? I don't know. I'm waiting to hear it. No, I'm honestly not sure why. I think... Those who've just watched the third ODI are going to think I'm crazy for saying it. But Shardul is one of those inexplicable picks for me. I'm not sure why he continues to get selected. He obviously ended with, in a match where West Indies only made 280, he ended with figures of 1 for 55. So not great. One Probably one of the one second most expensive bowler. I, I, I'm not sure. I think, you know, they gave Dubey a good shot. I understand why they wanted to go with one more specialist bowler. Um, but I don't know why it was Shardul. So. Anyway, that's all I got. Varun, was Dubey a little bit unlucky to miss out in your book? I think so. And I think so mainly because, uh, you know, we, we've spoken about this before, but I actually think Dubey could have played instead of Kedar's spot. And he didn't, look, he needs a bit of time. I know we're all very quick and me included. We, we do judge cricketers very early on, very quickly. But, you know, if you've decided to invest in a guy like Shivam Dubey, I think why not play him as the all-rounder um, instead of Kedar Yadav? So for me, that was a bit perplexing, but yeah. Interesting. So maybe we'll find out the answer when we come to talk about the third uh, ODI, no doubt, and Shardal's performance there. But let's talk about what India did. Uh, Rohit Sharma and KL Rahul both got hundreds. Um, Rohit Sharma went on to get 159. And of course, the moment he goes past 100, everyone starts thinking he's going to score a double 100, but he didn't. He scored 159, amazing batting. And he put on a fantastic partnership with uh, KL Rahul, 
who got 102. Let's talk a little bit about Rahul. I mean, he's been under pressure in the test arena. He's done well in the T20 game. He's got his chance here because Shikhar Dhawan's injured and he's really grabbed it with both hands, I think. And um, what did you guys make of his celebration? He put his... uh, and his fingers in his ears. So, Ashwin, what what was he trying to send? What message was he sending to the rest of the world? Yeah, it's an interesting one, right? You've heard before, you've seen before batsmen covering their ears, this one, fingers inside ears. I honestly haven't read any of the post-match speculations. I'm not sure if there's an answer as to what he was doing. My take at the time was just kind of, you know, drowning out the noise. I'm in my zone. I'm going to focus on my batting. Kind of like a, I'm letting my bat do the talking type of celebration. But it was just fingers in the ears. I'm not listening to all the all the crap that's out there, I'm focused on my game. So, yeah, Well, maybe he should have been listening to it. He got out, got out pretty quickly afterwards, which was <laughs> unfortunate. But Varun, uh, a couple of quick uh, words on Rohit Sharma's 159. I know we, again, so, sort of like him, uh, like Kohli, we take him for granted as well. But what an incredible innings, right? Yeah, what an incredible innings. What an incredible year for Rohit Sharma. He's just been fantastic. I think uh, he's only second to Sachin Tendulkar in terms of number of ODI hundreds in any one calendar year, which is a phenomenal feat. Um, yes, when Rohit gets started and starts teeing off, it's very exciting to watch. And like you said, DJ, I think everyone expects him to hit a 200. I don't think he's got a 200 this year. But I think the other great stat that actually came out is, I think since 2011 or 12, Rohit Sharma every year has had the highest ODI score by an Indian in that particular calendar year. So, um, no doubt, Rohit Sharma knows how to hit the big hundreds and it's great to watch him when he does. Can I just interject with one thing? Man, Ashwin, he's really, I, I, I was going to say, he's really stealing your stats Thunder here, but go on. Well, he stole the stats Thunder and he made sure to say he didn't get a double 100 this year. But that is only true in ODIs. Let's not forget Rohit, you know, kind of managed to get on the board in test matches this year, scoring uh, 212. So he got his first... Uh, Test match double century this year. So he did have a double, just not in the ODI format. That's true. And, and actually, I think what a year for Rohit to to come out and make a double 100 in test, right? You know him as an ODI batsman. So for, yeah, absolutely great. Point. Yeah, absolutely amazing. And and Varun, I actually now want to come to you about uh, one of your favorite players and one of our favorite players. I mean, the podcast is known as the Rishabh Pant Show amongst uh, the listeners. So Pant and Ayer, they put on 73 runs in four overs, just Absolutely keeping the uh, foot on the accelerator, just going, uh, as I said once, hell for leather. Pant got 36 of 19. Uh, Shreya Sayer got 53 of 32. Thoughts about those two young batsmen from the Delhi Capitals? And of course, uh, we should also point out uh, Pant plays for Delhi and uh, Shreya Sayer plays for Mumbai in the Ranji Trophy. So, DJ, I was telling somebody just today that in ODI, ODI cricket is, um, especially at home, is is a very long game to watch. But for me personally, right now, what I'm just enjoying is I just want to sit peacefully and watch Kohli, Ayer and Pant, right? You're number three, four and five. And in this particular game, Kohli got out for zero off his first ball to, to Pollard. So when Ayer and Pant went crazy, actually my dad and I were watching it together and we were just amazed at the kind of hitting they were doing, right? Um, Shreya Sayar more than Pant even uh, to be able to accelerate like that to be able to be known as a guy who has his head on his shoulders potentially the future captain of India um, and for him to come out and hit four sixes three fours at a strike rate of 165 was incredible I think there was a one over where I can't remember how many runs he took off but again we were just sitting in amazement and then Rishabh Pant again right like uh, we've talked a lot about him but 39 of 16 at a striker of 243 absolutely fantastic and for three of us it's even better right you've got the two Delhi Capitals boys uh, doing this in the middle order which just if you think about it five months ago these these two guys weren't even really in the middle order. So for them to come out and own it, I think it was great. Yeah, and Ashwin, anything to add to that? I know you're a big fan of Pant, Pant and Ayer as well. I mean, uh, anything to add on the Ayer performance? Yeah, I mean, it's just what's exciting is to see a day when the captain, the number one run scorer, the number one batsman in the world gets out for a first ball duck to then see Ayer and Pant come in and not get phased and make put together that incredible partnership was awesome. Just an amazing Amazing partnership. I just want to make sure we don't forget Kedar coming out at the end, making 16 of 10 with three glorious boundaries. So let's not discredit him as well. Oh, yes. Thanks for mentioning that because I'm sure we'll talk more and more about him as this show goes on. Um, Guys, very quickly, let's talk about the West Indian response. And I know we got 387 for five, which seemed huge. I mean, it was 100 runs more than what we got in the first uh, ODI, which the West Indies chased down. But at one stage... 
I don't know about you guys, but I was a little worried that the West Indies might be getting close to it. I mean, they were 86 for three, but then Puran got together with the, uh, with the Hetmeyer and it, sorry, Hetmeyer had been run out, but Puran got in and he just kept smashing the ball all over the park. And they were in 29 overs, 192 for three. And he had Shea Hope with him for company at that stage. And I was a little worried. So uh, Varun, I don't know what you thought. Did, did you think realistically they'd be able to chase down the 388 that we'd given them? Because the old uh, formula used to be just double where you are at 30 overs and the West Indies at that stage seemed on track to get the run. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I thought it was always, 387 was always a score that's going to be a little bit out of reach. Uh, India back, India backs their bowlers, our bowling has been doing well. So I was... Uh, I, I always thought that India would win this game after putting on 387, but I did get a little bit worried. And DJ, I've spoken about this before, but over the last two to three years, West Indies has been a team that has had so many ups and downs. But what I like about them is that they pace their innings very well, right? Especially in chases. They are able to keep at par with the required run rate. And for teams that are playing them, it's always worrying. Um, because West Indies, when they show up and their top five have probably got you the required run rate, even chasing a big score, you know what their lower order can do. So I was a little worried. I still knew that it was out of reach, but I really like the way they pace their game. Uh, Ashwin, before I forget, I know we, I just briefly mentioned Hetmeyer, who was the danger man in the first ODI, right? Did you see his run out by Ayer? I mean, what a great piece of fielding that was. Yeah, I didn't see it live, unfortunately, but I have caught the video since and absolutely stunning. I mean, you know, sometimes when you're watching a match like this where you got such a big total on the board, you watch it and think, are they really spending that much effort to stop the boundary, right? You saw, so just to quickly recap it, Ayer ran full speed, dived full length, stopped the ball from the boundary, flew over the rope, kind of got his got back on his feet, got back in, grabbed the ball and threw in an incredible flat, flat throw and that got him run out. But it's not just about the throw eventually. It's about the dedication, the commitment to chase that ball down, stop the boundary, and then in that process, put pressure on them to, you know, try to run the extra run and get the run up. So outstanding commitment. I mean, it's the moments like those that can bring the kind of energy, the the motivation to the rest of the side to get them over the line. Yeah, and particularly after he'd had a bit of a shocker in the first ODI, dropping that catch, he took a catch in the um, in the in, to get the first wicket for India. He then got that run out, and uh, then we dropped uh, Deepak Cheher. Actually, dropped. Um, Puran in the outfield, which wasn't great. But then Kuldeep pulled off a stunner in the outfield at the long leg boundary to get rid of Puran. And we were completely back in the game. Shami then dismissed Pollard for a first ball duck. And at that point, I was quite confident that India is going to win the game. And then comes on this guy, uh, Kuldeep Yadav, right? Who ended up with figures of 3 for 52. But those three wickets were part of a hat-trick. So Ashwin, just talk our listeners through what went on there. Yeah, it was pretty incredible. I mean, first off, great stats. The... What is it? The second, uh, the only Indian bowler to have two ODI hat tricks, just outstanding. So obviously the first one was was Shea Hope, right? Who was batting well, who's in the form of his life, had an absolutely incredible year. That was really, really incredible. I think that was an uh, outstanding Virat Kohli catch. He was right at the boundary. Shea Hope you know, skies the ball. Yeah, he was doing the karate kid, right? Like he was on one leg and he just caught it. I thought that was a great catch. Pretty much, yeah. Almost, almost fell over. Almost kind of after two ODIs of bad fielding, telling the telling the rest of the guys, this is how you do it. Okay, And then Jason Holder comes on. Finally, after, again, talking about bad fielding, after a bad series with the gloves for Rishabh Pant, he pulls off a pretty quick stumping. Not quite MS Dhoni quick, but quick enough, obviously, to get Jason Holder caught with his toes just in the air for a split second. And then at that point, honestly, you think, okay, potential for a hat trick. It's a bowler bat, bowler has come out to bat, etc. And Kuldeep comes in, left arm over the wicket, pulls the, this perfect googly, completely unreadable. Pretty smart, I have to say. I think Kohli added in a, a second slip. So also great captaincy. He, there was only one slip prior for the bowler coming on. Added a second slip. Alzari, Alzari Joseph went for the flick, which is never a good idea against Kuldeep Yadav to begin with, and got the outside edge. Flew to Kedar Jadav at second slip, completing the hat trick. So outstanding. I mean, after the first two, he sealed the the match pretty much for India. But that third wicket was just the cherry on the on top. Just really happy for a guy who's been in and out of the side, who's had some, who had a tough IPL last year, has had a tough run. Just really happy for Kuldeep. Yeah, absolutely brilliant captaincy, as you said, for that third wicket. And also, I think we need to give credit to that catch because I ball, as you said, flew to Kedar Jadav at second slip. And he would have not been sighted for a bit because 
the batsman would, was looking to play it on the leg side, right? So, fantastic reflexes from our 36-year-old, uh, who we'll talk about later in the show. But um, I, I'm really happy, as you said, for, for Kuldeep and really good. I thought Shami did particularly well, picking up three for 39 as well. So, I think he thinks the workload should be appreciated too. And it was a game in which both captains were out for a golden duck. I think it was the first time in the history of ODIs that had actually happened. So, a pretty interesting uh, stat trip with them. So, the games, were we'd won one game each and the series was tied one all. Everything to play for. So, things were going to script as uh, we predicted. All three possibility, uh, all uh, three podcasters could still have been, right? Ashwin and I saying it was 2-1 to India and Varun saying it was 2-1 to the West Indies. And then Deepak Cheher got injured. So we brought in uh, today Saini for Cheher. And uh, I don't know, Ash- Ashwin, what did you think of Saini's performance? I thought he was brilliant in the middle overs, but lacked a little bit of experience at the death. Is that a fair assessment, perhaps? Yeah, looking at the scorecard, yes. Just for anybody who doesn't exactly know, it's the game started at 3 a.m. my time. So I have to say, as much as I tried to, to follow along and watch, I was drifting in and out of sleep for the morning part. So I didn't watch Sandy Bowling all too much because in this case, West Indies batted first. But obviously it looks like, you know, nice to pick up two wickets. He The, the wicket of Roston Chase was quality. And then, yeah, he lo- loses his way a little bit in the death overs, but you cut a new player, there's some slack. I mean, he's been in the T20 setup for a while, but his first ever ODI, so you give him a little bit of credit. Yeah, absolutely agree. And he made his debut. He bowled really nicely. He went for some runs towards the end, which was, I mean, he still ended with only uh, 58 runs of his 10 overs, taking the two wickets. And that was slightly helped by Evan Lewis batting quite slowly. Shea Hope batted at kind of a runner ball. Roston Chase was promoted above Hetmeyer, which was a bit of a strained decision and came in for some uh, criticism. But the partnership of that innings really was Nicholas Puran and uh, Karen Pollard. I mean... What a series Puran has been having, batting really nicely in the second ODI and the third ODI. And they really plundered some runs off the uh, back back end of the innings. I think they got like 130 runs or something off the last 10, which was, I mean, it was an incredible performance to get up to 316, which uh, people still thought was below par. And it was a bit weird that the West Indies lacked in 10. But what that brought us to is a chase of 316 in 50 overs. Um, and Ashwin, I think you'd mentioned in the last episode that uh, you were expecting a Kohli masterclass to take us across the line in at least one of the remaining two ODIs. And um, that's what we got. We got 85 of 81 deliveries. I actually uh, made the mistake of tweeting out uh, before he'd even scored a run that there's a guarantee to Kohli 100 today. But uh, India, uh, Sharma, actually, let's start from the top. Sharma got 63, really smashing the ball everywhere. Rahul got 77. So, again, he got 102 last time, fell straight after his 100. Got to 77. A lack of concentration at 77, causing his downfall. Varun, you think? I mean, why does he get out so often before getting to three figures? It's He, he does all the hard work. He gets the runs. He gets his eye in. The team's depending on him. And he lets the... Uh, let's the start go to waste almost. And is that something he really needs to work on? Yeah, I think he does. I think what ends up happening, if you look at the last two games, his strike rate is always lower than everyone around him, right? Even in this game, while when Rohit went at 100, Kohli at 104. Um, and, you know, okay, I'm not going to talk about the rest because they didn't make that many runs. But the reality is, real Rahul goes at about 80 or 85 in the strike rate department for this game. He went at close to 100 in the last one. So I have a feeling he puts this pressure on himself during the middle overs that he needs to you know, bat faster and that leads to a few rash or reckless shots, which I don't think he, he should be worried about because he's playing really well. And in the absence of Shikhar Dhawan, I think India is not really missing uh, an opener because Rahul has stepped up. So yes, I think he just needs to work on that a little bit. And so do you think that he cemented his spot at the expense of Shikhar in the ODI uh, spot as well, in the ODI lineup as well, Varun? Look, it, it's a debate that, that's been happening for a while. Every time Shikhar Dhawan goes out, somebody comes in, does well, but Shikhar Dhawan makes a, makes a comeback. I think, uh, I don't want to comment about what might happen. I, I want to give my perspective. I think for T20s, Dhawan should just make room for Rahul. In ODIs, there's no major big tournament coming up, so I wouldn't be surprised if Dhawan comes back. But that that's my take on it. Okay, so interesting. And uh, of course, Kohli was still there when all of this was going down. He was joined very briefly by Ayer and then very briefly by Rishabh Pant. Um, I think Ayer just, 
kind of hit one down to uh, the throat of fine leg and he, he didn't actually con- control that very well of uh, Kimo Paul. Kimo Paul also got Rishabh Pant out for, um, I think he got seven of six deliveries with one boundary. And I know, I mean, we get tweeted in all sorts of stuff when Pant does well. We get tweeted in all sorts of stuff when Pant does badly. But um, I'm going to come to Ashwin for this, actually, because I know it's more emotional for Varun and he's, he's probably going to react more strongly to it. But Ashwin, what, where is Rishabh Pant at the end of 2020? Where, where does he stand at this point? I mean, he had a tough day with the gloves. He dropped a few. I'd say they were some of them were tough chances. They weren't all easy chances, but they were chances. And he dropped a few of them. He didn't get runs with the bat. Um, he let's not forget he got uh, seventy one and thirty nine in the first two games. Where does Rishabh Pant stand at the end of twenty twenty to your mind? Honestly, that's a really, really tough question, and I don't, uh, I don't know the answer. I think in a limited over setup, or I guess maybe in all setups, Rishabh Pant is really, really precariously balanced on the fence. I think you know a couple matches ago, <clears throat> I made the comment that I don't think he's shown that he has what it takes to be a long term pick just yet. Then he comes and, you know, hits that 39 of 16, which is perfect in that match situation. He picks up a quick stump, stumping, like I mentioned. So I guess my, my ultimate conclusion is he's still very, very much on the fence. He needs to have a strong series against Sri Lanka, Australia, and then a, he needs to have a rock star IPL for us to, for him to have a, a spot long term. Otherwise, they're going to start looking elsewhere. So I don't, the problem is he hasn't been bad enough to drop. He hasn't been good enough to cement. So he's right on that fence for me. So now that we've got the sensible answer from Ashwin Barun, I want the emotional answer from you. Where is Rishabh Pant right now? I know Dhoni had said, don't ask me till January. Where does that leave uh, Dhoni coming back and Rishabh Pant's future? I think 2020 is going to be Rishabh Pant's year. I think 2019 was a lot of uh, you know, he's he's in the team, he's not in the team, he's flown into the World Cup midway, uh, which I predicted, by the way. But anyway, I think uh, I think Rishabh Pant is going to come good in 2020. I think there is potential room for Dhoni and Pant to both be in a squad, right? I think if, if, if Dhoni does come back, it's going to be only in the T20 format, given the World Cup is coming up next year in 10 months time so I think in ODIs they're going to continue playing punt I think the key thing is if you really wanted you should have started thinking about either Rahul keeping or Samson coming in both have not been given enough chance so I agree with Ashwin that I think for 6 months till post the IPL I would say uh, Pant is going to continue. And, and what are we doing with Kedar Jadav? I know, I mean, everyone on Twitter is like, we need to get rid of him. I know you've said we are grooming him for 2027. That's, I thought that was an awesome comment. But, I mean, he's not bowling. He's He didn't contribute today. He got like 40 in the second ODI, which was okay. I mean, are we better off batting Jadeja one spot higher and just playing Pandya at seven and just continuing with the same lineup? I mean, a similar lineup with a similar setup without Kedar and uh, you get the extra bowling option by bringing Pandya in in instead. What do you think? Is is Kedar, why why are we still continuing to play him? I think Kedar is genuinely a lot of fun in the dressing room and I think that is why he's still in the team. Uh, I cannot understand why they do this. We've spoken about it a lot. But there is some likability factor about this guy. They can't get rid of him. They want to keep playing him. To give him credit, and I know Ashwin can talk stats, and but Ashwin and I talk about this a lot. He always does just enough to continue his spot for the next game. It's a very short-term view. It's a very, what I call a simple tactical kind of uh, approach, not a strategic approach. And so long as India continues doing that, I think uh, you're, you're missing out on some potential with either a Jareja, with a Dubey, with a Pandya. You're just, you're just kind of weakening your spot with this one player who doesn't do much, but yet is doing enough to keep his spot. Ashwin, your two bits on the Kedar question? Yeah, I think I always laugh when you ask for two bits. I think it's funny. Anyway, I have the majority of it to 12 year Sorry, really. what does that mean? Nothing, never what mind. Let's keep going. Please explain. No, I'm good. We're a family-friendly <laughs> show. Anyway, my point was... Um, I even forgot the question. I got so distracted. Yeah, no, Kedar Jadav. I think, listen... He, Varun's right. He's done just enough to keep justifying his place. And I've said this before. I'll say this over and over again. If there is any batsman who can bat in the top six and bowl even five overs, whether it's a Nitish Rana, whether it's a somebody else, 
The same issue, by the way, exists for the Delhi Capitals is we just have no batsmen who can bowl even one or two overs in a T20 or four or five overs. I think Kedar in the last few games hasn't really bowled much. So in that case, you have to believe there are better full-time batsmen out there who you can room for the future. But I think one of them needs to be able to bowl a few overs. If you notice, actually, in the first ODI, Shreyas bowled a couple overs, right? Was it the first or the second? I think it was the second ODI. So clearly, second, yeah. yeah, clearly, Virat, yeah, clearly, and he got hammered. But clearly, Virat has realized if Shreyas can give you a couple overs or anybody can give you a couple of overs, it alleviates a lot of pressure on that number six slot. So that's the challenge. Interesting. Is is Shardul Thakur perhaps a full time option for that uh, that slot? Because Ashwin today. Uh, actually, we've talked about Kedar. He got out, albeit a little bit unluckily, perhaps. But uh, at one stage, uh, then Jadeja joined uh, uh, Kohli and we needed 70-odd to get. And he brought it down to 30 to get. Uh, and then Kohli got out in the chase. And I mean, that would have shed, sent shivers down everybody's spine because apparently there was complete silence in the Katak Stadium. Kohli gone for 85, still need 30-odd to get. And Shardul Thakur walks in and plays an absolute blinder. He gets uh, 17 of 6 balls, which is usually what he gives away while he bowl, while he's bowling. So he gets 17 of 6 with the bat and almost wins us the game. So, I mean, is there something to be said about his all-round credentials? I know you've criticized him for his bowling and like um, he's, he's not a good enough bowler to play uh, in, in the side. But, I mean, he seems to have a little bit to add with the bat as well. So your, your let, let's not say two bits, your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he okay. He's batted thirty six, or he's played he's he's played thirty six matches. He's batted uh, eight innings for CSK and made a total of thirty six runs with a high score of fifteen. So I don't think there's enough data or credentialing just yet to say he could bat. Full credit where it's due. I mean, I'm not going to let my bias come in the way. He he took us over the line today with Jadeja. I mean, did one play for one person to stay there, and he did a great job. It's worth mentioning, I think Rohit said it at the end too, that his top edge, his six that he hit that got us all six was a nice thick top edge, but that's okay. Six runs are six runs. But obviously, no. I mean, jokes apart, nowhere near being an all-rounder just yet. Maybe a nice option to bat at eight or nine if he had the bowling to support it, but he just doesn't yet. Very interesting. So you're you're sticking to your guns that he that he doesn't deserve a place in the 11. But what it did end up is Jadeja got 39 um crucial runs and I, I was really pleased that Jadeja did that so well and at one stage he looked like he was going to get all, all the runs by himself and you could see Kohli just calming him down and telling him take the single and all of that stuff so it was good to see uh, Jadeja take on the responsibility of getting the team home so that was absolutely excellent what that meant was India had ended this decade winning the ODI series absolutely incredible again winning um Chasing 316, getting there with six wickets down, winning by four wickets, coming back from 1-0 down. So really feel good end to the decade, feel good end to the year for Indian fans. Really, really good. But what I want to pick up while before we get too happy with this stuff is um, two things. One, our fielding, guys. I mean, what's gone on with our fielding in the last few games? I mean, we talk about this a lot. We've become an absolutely gun fielding side during the World Cup. I mean... Incredible fielding performances all through. And we seem to be dropping catches, misfielding, missing the stumps, uh, missing stumpings, we're missing catches behind the wicket. It was just stuff that we just took for granted earlier in the year. What's gone on in the last, I'd say, two or three months, Ashwin? I don't know whether you have anything to say about that. Yeah, I mean, it's just disappointing. I'm not exactly sure why, how it happened, etc. All, all I'll say is it's not going to be acceptable for Kohli. You watch, by the way, when he's batting with Jadeja, how excited he is that Jadeja is running. You know, Jadeja follows his call. He runs full speed. He runs the first run hard. And that's the kind of player Kohli has a lot of respect for. So I have no doubt, even between now and January 6th, when India plays their next game against Sri Lanka, there's going to be a lot of a lot of discussion, a lot of focus on the on the, tr- the fielding and the training regimen. Well, Ashwin, you know what's happened in the last three to four months, right? The only difference there's no MS Dhoni on the field. Oh my God! I can't believe we got to that already. How long, DJ? Are we keeping track? How long till we get uh, Dhoni mentioned in this show? Oh, we, we oh. mentioned him much earlier. Yeah, but that's what you. I think you just yeah, like when you've muted the, the word Dhoni in your brain, like you can mute stuff on Twitter. I think you just muted Dhoni in your brain. You don't listen. You don't hear it. It just filters out. So let's go through it. We don't have a good finisher. Kuldeep and Chahal are shitty without him. Now all the fielders are bad without him, Varun. Is that what you're saying? 
All the fillers are bad without him. The stumpings are getting missed without him. I mean, stumpings is the only one I think is actually true. <laughs> it's the only one that's real. That's him doing the study. I absolutely love the way Varun's fluidly moving his way back to the MS Dhoni side of the debate. It's so he's good. not. He's I'm just trolling me. Let's be clear. January, man. He'll be back and we have to have enough to talk about. So No, but we can't talk about it until January because Thala is said. Can't talk about it. January tak mat poochho. But anyway, guys, so, so that wraps up the uh, India performance and stuff. I think we kind of have a handle on where our best 11 is. I'm, I'm going to read out the order as I think it should be. I think Rahul Rohit opening Kohli Ayer Pant. I think Hardik and Jadeja should be 6 and 7. Uh, with Bhuvi and Chahar 8, Shami, uh, Kuldeep or Chahal and Bumra. I don't know whether you guys have anything to add to that or anything that you disagree with completely. Of course, Shikhar will always remain in the mix. Uh, maybe Varun, I'll ask you whether you thought... I mean, Kedar is obviously not in that lineup, right? So I don't know whether you disagreed with anything in in that lineup. No, I actually, I actually think that's a great lineup, DJ. I think that with Pandya and Bumrah back, you've got Jadeja as the extra bowling option. I, I think that's a great lineup. Ashwin, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think on a day your top three fail, Pandya six, Jadeja seven is just a little weak. So my only hope, and if Instagram videos are proof of anything. My only hope is that Pandya is in the net focusing on his batting because we know he's got what it takes with the ball, but he needs to be a solid, he needs to upgrade a little bit to be a solid number six. Awesome. But on a day that India's top three fail is only the semifinals of any tournament, right? Yeah, for sure. So we'll get through the first nine games without having to deal with that anyway. Yeah. We'll be number one on the table and then uh, hopefully Kohli can bat at four on that day. Kohli said it again, by the way. He said we had a fabulous night 2019 except for 30 bad minutes. Which is true, right? I mean, it's so... Anyway, it's, let's not get depressed again, guys. I thought that the decade ended on a very positive note with uh, lots of good things happening. So let's go to break on a positive feel-good note. Um, we will talk about 2019 and the other half of the show. We will talk about the rest of the decade in the other half of the show. So, guys, stay tuned and we'll be straight back after this break. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast at Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'd also like to thank our sponsors on the network this week, Intel, Storytel, and Camly. Check them out. They're a really good bunch of brands. This week in the spirit of Christmas, instead of giving you the long drawn out promo that I normally do, all I'm going to do is ask you to give me a Christmas gift. Go to ivmpodcast.com slash survey, fill out our survey and send it out to us. We'd really appreciate it. And with that, let's get you back to your show. Welcome back after this break, guys. And you're still listening to the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast. We've talked about India's fabulous win in the India West Indies ODI series. They also won the T20 series, remember, guys. But the other big thing that happened last week was the IPL auction. Ashwin, did you follow the IPL auction? And uh, can you talk your uh, our listeners through some of your top picks, highlights and surprises? I followed it. I watched it. I got excited. I kept messaging you guys. At some point, you weren't paying attention. So disappointed in you both as podcast hosts that you weren't watching the whole thing. Man, you woke up at 5 a.m. to watch it. Sorry, I shouldn't have asked you whether you followed it. You were up at 5 a.m. to watch some people sit around a table and raise a paddle. It's not just some people say, okay, fine. When you say it like that, it sounds really bad. But... Uh, it was fantastic. I love, I was joking with you on the phone, but like you look at me as a person in my life, like the, the business side of it, the strategy side of it, the numbers, the math, and then of course cricket. It's just perfect. The auction is a perfect day for me. I, I've watched it every year. I love it. So a dream job for you then to be a, a part of the IPL auction at some stage. Maybe it'll happen. Yeah. If any, if any, if any franchises listen to this show and you need somebody to at least stand on the, sit on the table with you and raise the paddle, I'll happily do that first. Awesome. Anyway couple of highlights. I mean, I'm not going to go through every single team. A few things that stood out for me. Obviously, number one, KKR picked up the number one bid of the of the day, of the year, which was Patrick Cummins. Outstanding bowler with a great test record, but went for 15.5 crore. So I guess, so that I don't talk for too long, Varun, let me ask you, do you think that Patrick Cummins is worth 15.5 crores to, to KKR? I think the only note I'll highlight there is, although they have Andre Russell... Uh, Sunil Narayan, and they have Lockie Ferguson and Kuldeep Yadav, they didn't have an out-and-out lead kind of strike fast bowler from overseas. So was he worth 15 and a half crore or so? I don't, I don't think he was worth 15 and a half crores, but I think all of us knew the highest bid is going to go to Pat Cummins uh, for his main kind of fast bowling ability, but also his handy, 
handy handiness. I don't know if that's a word uh, for, but also for his batting ability. So I knew Pat Cummins would be the highest. I don't think fifteen point five. I, I think fifteen point five is a bit too high. But yeah, I was I was surprised Delhi didn't try harder for Pat Cummins. Yeah, I mean, what was interesting is there were two sides in a clear bidding war for him, all the way up to fourteen crores, and then kind of unexpectedly. KKR just showed up with 15, 15 and a half and then closed it out. So pretty amazing. What I thought was really interesting is Joy Bhattacharya on Crickbuzz live video, which yes, DJ, not only was I watching the auction, but in the breaks, I was flipping over to Crickbuzz analysis to watch their, their take. But anyway, one of the things he said is the KKR owners are a family that's big into art and art collection. Uh, or whatever, one of the owners, aside from Shahrukh and Juhi. And so he said, you know, they're used to this. They're used to this auction culture, this auction strategy. And he said, they're not phased by letting two others fight and bid and bid and bid to get the value up and then swoop in at the end and take it away. So I thought that was an interesting insight. I, don't, I can't vouch for how true it is. But obviously, Cummins was the single kind of biggest, biggest purchase this year around. The, my only closing thought on that is that's what makes auction so fascinating is Cummins' value skyrocketed the day Stark said he's not going to put his name in the reckoning. So it wasn't even so much about him individually. It was just the lack of supply of overseas quick bowlers. The next most exciting one is actually Varun, somebody who you mentioned in jest you thought would be uh, a big pick, and that's, of course, Piyush Chabla. DJ, did you get to follow or watch that? Do you know where he ended up? Yeah, 6.5 crores. Top Indian, uh, top paid Indian player this this time around, right? So, uh, well done, Varun, uh, for mocking him. I, I, I was not joking at all. I don't know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> there's there's audio footage recording of it. Of course, he ended up at a team where, uh, how old is Piyush Chabla? 31, I think. Wow, I thought he's like at least 35 plus. He's 30. So 30-year-old Piyush Chavla ended up at a team where he is on the younger side of things. He's below the average age. Varun, any guesses where he ended? Yeah, Chennai Super Kings. And MS Dhoni has just got this obsession with spinners. I mean, they've got Tahir, they've got Karan Sharma, they've got Harbhajan Singh. I really don't know where Piyush Chavla is going to play. Yeah, so we'll see. It's going to be pretty fascinating. The third kind of big one was Glenn Maxwell. He went for uh, 10.7, I think, yeah, 10.7 crores. Big purchase, you know, obviously come back. He's had a pretty good run other than yesterday at the Big Bash. So exciting. He's gone to Kings 11 Punjab. So he's going to be up the top order there with KL Rahul and should be pretty exciting. Kings 11 also bought Sheldon Cottrell for 8.5 crores, which we thought was a, you know, we thought he'd go for a, a pretty big amount. And so good for him. Disappointed kind of personally that Keswick Williams, who we interviewed on last or midweek's episode, didn't get picked up. Let's talk a little bit about Delhi. So they, they came to the auction all guns blazing. They bid on almost all of the first few players. The big marquee purchase was Shimron Hetmeyer. DJ, we talked a little about one of the things I thought Delhi needed was an overseas all-rounder who can finish. Hetmeyer doesn't bowl, but he is a quality finisher. He's had a tough year in T20s, but overall, are you pretty happy with that purchase? I think pretty good uh, purchase for the Delhi Daredevils, Delhi Capitals. Um, not complaining, although we've got quite a lot of batting and uh, I'm sure we'll come to it later, but uh, Wokes would be the absolute uh, key for us in, in this year if he can if he's around for most of the season, actually. But I, I like the Hetmeyer pick. It's... Um, I think it shows the intent from the owners to actually go after this trophy. Yeah, well said. I think the, you mentioned Wokes as well, so Varun will be pretty excited. We didn't Delhi didn't bid for Pat Cummins, but we bid for the one the one player who beats them on the one attribute, which is how good looking they are. Which I think, according to Varun, Wokes beats out Pat Cummins on that one. So Chris Wokes came to Delhi as well uh, as a I guess quote unquote all rounder, but mostly obviously a, a fast bowler. Uh, and then the last one I wanted to highlight was. Of course, Chris Lynn, which was kind of a fascinating one. He was the first name that came up on the in the auction pool. He got one bid at his base price from the Mumbai Indians, and honestly, the owners kind of just looked like, "Yeah, let's put it, let's start the bidding and see where it goes." Nobody else bid, and Chris Lynn is now making his way to the Mumbai Indians for his base price of two crore. Pretty unbelievable, and now he's he came off a huge innings yesterday in the Big Bash, and so suddenly it looks like a steal and a masterstroke from the Mumbai Indians to have a top order batsman. I like Chris Lynn. I'm not sure where he fits into their structure, but an amazing, amazing talent to have on the bench. So overall, I think those were my major highlights. There were lots of other players who got uh, bought and sold. I mean, Robin Othapa got picked up by the Rajasthan Royals, which we're happy for him to, to find a great home. Um, Sunrisers Hyderabad made kind of the one interesting purchase that I was watching, and that's Priyam Garg, who's now off to the under-19 World Cup. Obviously not selfishly just saying that because he, we share a last name with him. I don't know if we're related. Warren, do you know if we have any connection to him? 
need to get him on to interview him. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so oh, I would ho- I would hope so now. Yeah, that would be great if they win the under nineteen World Cup for sure. And so la- last thought is just I think most sides look fairly well rounded. Hyderabad didn't buy anybody, but we didn't think they needed anybody major. I mean, anybody other than Priam and KKR likes here looks rock solid on their first eleven, uh, but doesn't look like they have a ton of depth. So. I think we're pretty well set up for a great year. It's going to be a fun, a fun 2020 IPL and pretty good auction performances by most of the teams. Yeah, thanks, Ashwin. Really great summary of the high, highlight picks. And I actually particularly enjoyed that uh, RCB eventually did go for Stain, which uh, I totally saw coming because, I mean, Kohli just loves Stain. And I think he actually said as much, or Mike Hessen said as much on, on his behalf. So that was uh, pretty amusing. Um Guys, so the IPL is going to come up next year. The year is coming to an end. Ashwin, Varun, I'm going to ask you some questions about kind of looking back. I mean, we've had an incredible year of just following cricket. We've had the IPL, we've had the Cricket World Cup, we've had the Ashes, and then we've had all the follow-up series after that. We're now building up to the next big multilateral tournament in Australia next year, which hopefully three of us will be at. Guys, is this the best year of cricket in recent memory for you guys. And if it is, what is the highlight for each of you? So Ashwin, I'm going to ask you first, what, what, how do you, how would you encapsulate 2019 in terms of being a cricketing year? We've been very fortunate to follow it and uh, speak to all you guys about it, but is this the greatest year of cricket you've ever seen? Basically is my question. And what is the greatest moment in that year? Yeah, I mean, it has to be right up there. Just an outstanding year from India's test, all starting all the way from India's test victory in, uh, down under in Australia through the incredible world. We had a great IPL this year, a great World Cup, just an outstanding year of cricket. So I don't know, it's really hard to say if it's the best one ever, but it's definitely right up there, a really, really great year. As much as we're an Indian cricket podcast, I'm an Indian fan, I do have to say I think the moment of the year is is the incredible World Cup final we had. I don't think we'll ever match up to anything like that. England and New Zealand, both top-notch sides. I would have loved to see India in that, but just an outstanding final. So really, really happy for, for what that brought for the game. Varun, your thoughts on 2019 as a cricketing year and your favourite moment of that year? Yeah, so I think I agree with everything Ashwin said. I think there's going to be a lot of obvious ones in terms of whether it's Ashes, the World Cup final. Well, I'm going to take a slightly different approach. I'm going to say my favourite part of the year was the IPL and watching the Delhi Capitals really do well this year after almost... 10 years or at least 8 years of just watching and and watching them fail, I was extremely happy with their performance this year. So that was a big highlight for me. Very good. So you've actually gone with a left field pick for that. I would actually go with Ben Stokes' 135 in the Ashes, which I mean... And I knew you were going to say that and I knew Ashwin was going to say the World Cup final. So I, oh, that's why my how did you know that? I just... Yeah, you should have said it before. But, uh, now we can. Now yeah. Anybody can say anything after that. <laughs> no, because I'll, I'll tell you why. Because Deepak's memory is so good that I didn't remember he scored one thirty-five in which ground, in which month, on which day. He scored it at Headingley. Exactly. So that, that that's why I didn't choose Ben. Stokes. Oh, nice. And Puji Bhag, Ben Stokes. But uh, apart <laughs> apart from that, I thought one hundred and thirty-five Ashes was just incredible innings. I mean, to win that Test match from that uh, stage was just absolutely brilliant. Um, I think I can speak for us all when I say the lowest moment was the 10th slash 11th of July 2019. Any any objections? The two-day international? The two-day international. Varun? <laughs> no, man. I think that was the lowest point. I think as 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 uh, Ashwin said, Kohli still alluded to it. I mean, he said we 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 go we're going after a ICC trophy. He thinks that the team deserves it, and I mean that was a strong word to use. Honestly, to say that a team deserves to win an ICC trophy. Um, but clearly, it still hurts him. Rohit mentioned it as well, saying a World Cup win would have been nice. Uh, 2019 was a good year for me personally, but a World Cup win would have been nice. Uh, so, I think that was just a, a sad moment for all Indian fans. But, I mean, incredible. The India winning the series in Australia, incredible moment. So, I think that was a very close second for me. Um, in terms of... Um, in terms of just drama, because I think we beat them quite comprehensively and quite easily. It was more dramatic, the Stokes moment. But I think as a as an Indian fan, if I had to pick an Indian moment, it would have to be India winning the Test Series in Australia. Just incredible, incredible moment. 
Uh, actually, Ashwin, um, I was going to ask you, did, did we have some stats about uh, Rohit and Virat over the year and the decade? Because, I mean, there's been lots of stuff going on around, about them. And where do all of them stand in terms of uh, having a good year and a good decade, etc.? Yeah, pretty cool stats this year. Because India's played their last game, we're going to assume these will stay up top. So I won't spend too much time. I know we're running a little bit over. But ODIs in 2019, top run scorer was Rohit Sharma with 1490. And Virat was close second with 1377. It's worth saying Virat played two, two less innings than him. So who knows? You know, 113 runs in two innings is right around where Virat would score. But kudos to Rohit for that. What is interesting is across all three formats, so we don't normally look at numbers like this, but if you combine all three formats, the order gets flipped, but the top two are the same. Virat had the most number of runs in 2019 with 2,455, and Rohit fell 13 runs short. So if you guys remember at the start of this, uh, when Virat walked out after Rohit got out, I said he needs 72 to equal Rohit for total, the most total number of runs. He obviously made 85, so he got 13 runs ahead of Rohit. So just imagine that. In the kind of breakthrough year Rohit Sharma had, he still fell second to Virat by 13 runs in terms of total runs scored across all three formats. So pretty outstanding. If you then extend that kind of record to... To the decade. I'm going to ask you guys actually. I know, DJ, you have a potential quiz coming up, but can anybody guess who scored the most runs in ODIs uh, in the decade, the, the starting first year in 2010? Kohli has to be. He scored like 20,000 runs in the decade or something crazy. Yeah, Kohli. Yeah. I like how Varun just says, yeah, of course it is Kohli. <laughs> Later. <laughs> anyway. Come on, man. He played the 2011 World Cup and he did well even there. So. Can somebody guess who's second across all? All formats combined, meaning T Twenty Eight has to know DI. All internationals combined. Uh, David, 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 David Warner. David Warner is sixth, fifth. Ooh. Anyway, Sangakara. No, Sangakara is top ten, but he retired in fifteen, right? So he scored twelve thousand yeah. runs despite only playing the first five years. The answer is Hashim Amla, fifteen thousand runs. Wow, so that's a tough one. Wow, that's and a that's great stat. All Incredible stat. That's uh, across all three formats. But if again, just to wrap up, in ODIs as well, in the decade, the number one run scorer, Virat Kohli, 11,100 runs. The number two run scorer, Rohit Sharma, with 8,249 runs. So he played fewer innings, but outstanding. I mean, this decade, Kohli has averaged over 60 in ODIs. Rohit has averaged over 53. Just absolutely incredible. So fantastic year. I mean... We know the internet is divided on who supports either. I'm just personally so thrilled to have both those, both these guys in our top three because they're just both legends of the game already. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I mean, just what a, what a year it's been. Rohit making his way into the test side as an opener as well. And I mean, you can see that they actually both feed off each other's success no matter what the internet and Twitter actually says. They, they do actually enjoy batting with each other as well. And just we are very fortunate, as you say, to have them both in our side. So we, we've talked a little bit about this decade and how Kohli has dominated it. So, guys, what is um, your favorite cricketing memory of this decade? And I'm going to put a caveat out there because we put a tweet out and we got a lot of responses. You can't say India winning the T20, uh, 2011 World Cup in 20, uh, in 2011, of course. The World Cup in 2011, because that is just an absolute given. So that's not counted. What is your next favorite memory from this decade across the years 2010 to 2019? Ashwin? Can you go to Varun first? You, I, that's a big question. I haven't really thought about it. Okay, yeah. So maybe, maybe you can then like follow what he says. Varun, go for it. I'm going to just say the rise of Jaspreet Bumrah and India's fast bowling unit. That for me has defined this decade. Wow. India's fast bowlers. So that's like in the last two years pretty much of... Uh, of this decade, so 2018, 2019. I think for me, if you if you take out the World Cup in 2011, and then you you look at you look at, I mean, I'm just looking at it from a perspective of this, like watching Indian in the Indian team's fast bowling has never been so exciting. I'd actually wake up at 5 a.m. to watch our bowling rather than our batting now uh, on a tour to Australia, and so for me that is kind of that's something that in my 20 years of watching cricket has never happened. Incredible, Ashwin. Yeah, I'm a big one. Tough answer. I, I'm just trying to think back and say, okay, how do I not say something that's in the last one or two years? Because that's, uh, you know, where my bias would go. And if you ask about the, the decade, I'm not going to say the World Cup victory because I am not. I wasn't allowed. But there's something about that moment that will be etched in my mind forever when Kohli lifted Sachin on his shoulders and said the line, like he's carried 
India on his shoulders for so long, it's time somebody carries him. And it, it, it was amazing for two things. One, it was the, it was the passing of the torch. It was, you know, Sachin calling it, almost calling it a day and Virat picking up the, the future of Indian cricket. And two, it's amazing that a guy who says stuff like, Shamta Kelinge dot 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 can also come up with such amazing <laughs> lines and such powerful lines. So it's just pretty cool that Kohli has both sides. Yeah, brilliant. So, I mean, we put our tweet out as well. I mean, that's an absolute line for the ages. And I think some of the um, listeners actually wrote back with that. But others wrote back saying, Kohli scoring 100 at Edgbiston. That was money at the rate of Cyborg 92. That was an incredible moment. I think you can still remember Kohli, how he celebrated. Rahul actually wrote in, Rahul Dendukuri wrote in Grant Elliott lending a hand to Stain after that crazy 2015 World Cup semi-final at Eden Park. Another iconic image from a World Cup. Tanmay Joshi writes in, uh, talking about Munaf Patel's slowest of slow ones to dismiss Abdul Razak in the uh, World Cup semi-2011. It was so unexpected when the match was in balance. Balwinder Singh writes in, saying Ben Stokes 135 not out in the ashes. So he agrees with me. And Bumrah's big slow ball to Sean Marsh at the MCG. I was there. That was incredible. I think it was the last ball before lunch. Absolute game changer. Sumit, is, um, Sumit writes in, Sumit Gupta saying, when the Superman from India reached 200 against SA on the 24th of February 2010, such a proud moment and the memories of the dab towards the offside and the single to complete the landmark reaction of the team giving a bow is all etched in my mind and heart. And lastly, Nikhil, actually one of our earliest listeners, Nikhil R. Day, says Sehwag clubbing four consecutive boundaries to Umar Gul in 2011 semi-final. So man after Varun's heart. Guys, thanks for writing in with all those answers. We can't actually read out all of them for time reasons, but thank you so much. Much appreciated that you wrote in with all those responses. And guys, to wrap up this year and to wrap up this show, we're going to do a quiz, but this time it's going to be me being the quiz master with the two Garg brothers answering the questions. And because it's me being the quiz master, and because tomorrow, the 23rd of December 2019, is going to be 15 years of Mahindra Singh Dhoni making his international debut, it's going to be about MS Dhoni and his career. So I'm going to ask you each eight questions, guys. Okay. And you're going to respond. And whoever gets more questions right wins. I'm going to ask Varun the questions, eight questions first. And I'm going to ask Ashwin a separate set of eight questions. Okay. Big brother goes first. Okay. It's a multiple choice question. Okay, Varun. So um, the first question to you. Dhoni was playing a sport other than cricket when his skills caught the eye of his future coach. But what sport was he playing? One, badminton. Two, football. Three, hockey. Football. Goalkeeping. That is correct. Well done. Next question to Ashwin. Dhoni's it's played over choice. 500. Yeah. yeah, it's multiple choice. He's played over 500 international matches. Two of the players that I'm going to name reached the 500 mark before him. But which of these players didn't reach that number of matches? First one, Anil Kumble. Second one, Sachin Tendulkar. Third one, Rahul Dravid. Uh, which didn't reach that number of matches at all? Yeah. I'm going to go with Anil Kumble. That is correct. Yes. So it's one all. Well point. Done. I was wondering I'll get zero out is, of eight. This is your first ever point on the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast because you're always the quiz master, right? <laughs> this is exciting for me. Yeah, it's pretty good. So, Varun, your next question. Dhoni has won the IPL three times, right? He has won the IPL three times. But how many times has he reached the final? The options are four, six and nine. Um, just give me one second. Let me think. It started in 2008. So the question is, Dhoni has won the IPL three times, but how many times has he reached the final? No, the middle, the your middle option. So four, six and eight, you're put going with six. Yeah. That is incorrect. Four, six and nine, that is incorrect because he's won it. Uh, he's reached the final nine times because remember he um, doesn't, didn't always play for the Chennai Super Kings. Chennai, yeah. So Ashwin, next question for you. Dhoni was run out on ODI debut in 2004 for a golden duck. Who were India playing? Option A, Pakistan. Option B, Australia. Option C, Bangladesh. Uh, Australia? That is incorrect. So the score remains at one all. It is Bangladesh is the correct answer. Oh, I thought. Going back to Varun. Varun, Dhoni has a love for a certain mode of transport, but what is it? Option A, motorbikes. Option B, quad bikes. Option C, steam trains. Can I say Uber? No. 
What is he advertising for Uber? No, I don't think Do so. Do you want to go with that answer? No, it's Do you want to go with that answer? <laughs> motorbikes. Motorbikes, and that is correct. Cast- Castrol GTX. Very nice. Sponsor. Ashwin, next question for you. You seem to be getting a slightly harder question than Varuna. It's Dhoni has been. Yeah, this is unfair. Man, he went first, dude. He you had the option. So, Dhoni has been known to turn his arm over on occasion. Who did he take his solitary ODI wicket against? Option A, New Zealand. Option B, Sri Lanka. Option C, West Indies. Uh, for some reason, I have in my head that he took uh, he took Kevin Peterson. So, none of those countries. Let's go with West Indies. Kelo the Mark say you've got that right, man. Well done. West Indies is the correct answer. Oh wow, that is a pure guess. Right, moving on. No, because this is going to be a tough one. And he 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 did get Kevin Peterson out, but I think they reviewed it. They reviewed it and it was not out. It lords, I think we were there. Oh. Right? Oh. Horrendous. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, 2011, when Zach went off. Anyway, moving on, guys. Can I get half a point extra for that? Uh, it wasn't part of the question. So, <laughs> okay, moving on. Varun, next question. How many test centuries does Dhoni have to his name? Option A, 6. Option B, 10. Option C, 15. 6, 10, or 15 test centuries by MS Dhoni. 6. We're going with six, and that is the correct answer. Sahid Jawab, well done. And he has Ashwin. zero of them in England and Australia, and only one Indian wicketkeeper batsman has ever got centuries in England and Australia. You have to decide, man. You can't love and hate him at the same time. <laughs> Pant, you just have to love him, or you have Go to. Go on, next him. question. Okay, <laughs> Ashwin, Ashwin, moving on. This is an easy one, I think. Along with the Chennai Super Games, which other IPL outfit has Dhoni played for? Option A, Sunrisers Hyderabad. Option B, Rising Pune Super Giants. Option C, Deccan Chargers. Rising Pune Super Giant, actually, it was called. In the second year, that is correct. And that's the one that reached the final, no? Yeah, I guess that's <laughs> true. It wasn't, yeah, that wasn't all CSK. Nice. So this is quite close. I mean, you you guys have tied at three all after four questions each. So this is going down to the wire. I mean, you're, it's an MS Dhoni quiz. Of course, it goes down to the last question. Varun, Dhoni was the first player to pick up ICC's ODI Player of the Year award twice in a row. In which years did he achieve that feat? Option A, 2009 and 2010. Option B, 2007 and 2008. Option C, 2008 and 2009. I think 7 and 8. 2007, 2008? Yeah. That is incorrect. It's 2008 and 2009. So you've got that one wrong. So it gives Ashwin a chance to get into the lead. Ashwin, what is Dhoni's highest test score that he notched against Australia in 2013? Option A, 224. Option B, 296. Option C, 176. The options are... Man, I actually don't know why. I actually, I got this. Okay. I got this. Okay. 224, man. It's got to be it. That is correct. And I think it came up a couple of episodes, or not a couple of episodes, a few episodes ago, right? We talked about it, I think. Okay. Varun, this. One of the first few I didn't have to guess, so I actually deserve that. Correct. So Ashwin's actually now ahead. Varun, time to uh, up your game. What is Dhoni's test batting average? Option A, 38.09. Option B, 44.09. Option C, 41.09. Options again, 38.09, 44.09, and 41.09. I'm going to go with 41.09. That is incorrect. You've overestimated his batting average. Oh, He's 38.09. Man. Remember, he hasn't scored hundreds in Australia. And in yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, I, can I just observe that every option, Varun picks the middle one? Is it 4, 6, or 9? He picks 6. Is it 38, 41, or 44? He picks 41. So he's going safe. Well, this is why I didn't want to do a, a quiz where the question passed to him. You see, yeah. this, this is the beauty of the system. Fair enough. He's got to actually answer his own <laughs> question. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, Ashwin, moving on to your questions. Dhoni's 183 in 2005 against Sri Lanka is a record score in an ODI. But what record is that? The highest score in an ODI against Sri Lanka, A. Most fours in an ODI innings. Or highest score by wicket keeper in ODIs. So three options. Tony is one eighty three not out in two thousand five. What record score is it in an ODI? Highest score against Sri Lanka. Most fours in an ODI innings or highest score by wicket keeper in ODIs. Um, I want to say wicket highest by wicket keeper, but yeah, okay, let's go with that. It's good you went with your instinct because that is the correct answer, oh, man. Yeah, this is now. We have we've really come to a crunch time now for Varun. Varun needs to get these right. Uh, 
Varun, this is an easy one. I mean, you were you there? I can't remember were you there for that or not. So, which team knocked Dhoni's India out of the World Cup semi-final in 2015? Australia. That is correct. So, well done. So, you've got a score on the board there. Okay. Um, Ashwin, this is an interesting stats-based question for you, actually. Dhoni has hit the fifth most sixes in international cricket and is one of the three Asian players in the top five. Shahid Afridi has the most, but which Asian batsman also sits in the top five? Virendar Sehwag, Sanat Jaisuriya, or Tilak Ratne Dilshan? That is a fantastic question. I have no idea, but it's a great question. I'm going to go with Jaisuriya. That is the correct answer. And I think that question is slightly out of date because I think Rohit Sharma is creeping up on that. I'll have to recheck whether he, he has to be yeah. one of three or one of four, but I'll check that. But it's, Jaisuriya is the correct answer. So Ashwin continues. His amazing run at this stage. So, Varun, I think we spoke about this next question uh, recently. So, how many innings did it take Dhoni to score his first T20I half century? Options are 1, 5 and 66. 66. That is correct. So, Varun stays alive. Ashwin, you can finish this off. For once, he didn't go with the middle option. (laughs) So, so this is 1, 5 and 66. I love the sledging between the Gurd brothers. We should do this more often. I think that it brings out some good old sibling rivalry here. <laughs> but um, Ashwin, your question. For the uh, for the quiz, actually, to win the MS Dhoni quiz, uh, the question is, Dhoni has captained his country across all formats a record 332 times. Who is second on this list? Option A, Ricky Ponting. Option B, Stephen Fleming. Option C, Graham Smith. Ricky Ponting? And that is the MS Dhoni quiz that's gone to Ashwin Garg. That is absolutely yes. incredible. Ashwin gets 7 out of 8. Varun does creditably. He's got 5 out of 8. So, guys, well done. I mean, good effort. So, you guys are actually MS Dhoni fans, uh, despite what you might claim to be. Uh, so, well done. You can't see me right now, but my, ar- but my arms are wide like Tahir and I'm running around my room. <laughs> Well done. Well done. And I think, yeah, Ashwin is clearly a big MS Dhoni fan. I think my, you know where my loyalties lie. And for both of you, in December 2029, I'll be doing an 11-year special for Rishabh Pant quiz. So just be ready we, for that. We would absolutely love to take part of that. And hopefully we are still doing that podcast in 11 years. But guys, thanks once again for joining me. It's been a slightly long episode, but there was lots to talk about. It is the last episode of the year. It's been an incredible year for us. I mean, we've covered... The IPL, we've covered India winning in Australia. We've covered the Cricket World Cup. We've covered the Ashes, all the India series. We've joined a podcast network, IVM, India's biggest podcast network. We've interviewed two international cricketers, one of which we did last week, which was absolutely amazing, where he talks about uh, sledging Virat Kohli, which was quite surreal to for some of us. Also, I think we just want to thank our listeners because the feedback you guys give us keeps us going, coming back every week. It's absolutely fantastic to hear from you guys it makes sure that we try and keep working on the show trying to make it better for you guys and we love doing the show as long as you guys keep listening to it we'll be doing the show we will now be taking a break for next week and we will be back to recording the podcast on the 5th of january so because you won't be hearing from us please have a very very merry christmas and a very happy new year and we will see you in 2020 with more episodes of Edges and Sledges. It's been an absolutely fantastic year and we're now going to sign off. So thank you from everyone at the Edges and Sledges team. Cheers. Filter coffee is a fascinating beverage. You need to pick the right beans, blend them in the right proportion, roast them to perfection, and slow brew at the right temperature to get the perfect cup. Which is exactly like great conversations as well. You need to track down the most interesting minds, get them into their zone, and settle down for an unhurried, unscripted chat. And coffee for me is always, always, always best enjoyed with friends. I'm Karthik Nagarajan, and do share my table as I meet some of the most interesting people I know and sit them down for a strong cup of coffee and an even stronger conversation. Join me every Wednesday for a freshly brewed episode. This is not Frappe. This is the Filter Coffee Podcast. Hi. 
Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Paisa Paisa, a show that talks money. On my show, I speak to experts from every field of money and finance, from stock markets, equities, debt funds, credit cards, life insurance, every possible area of money and finance that you can think of. We even did an episode on cryptocurrency. I've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere. Robo advisory startups, just name it, we've got it. At Pesa Pesa, we help you make smart decisions about money. You work hard for money. Now make your money work hard for you. New episodes out every Monday and you can listen to my show on the IVM podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have.